go ahead and get started. So I've had the privilege today of introducing our guest speaker, Jeff Miller from Documentum. Jeff is uh, currently with Red Point Ventures and um, looking at a number of technology companies in, uh, in the, as a venture capitalist, but his primary claim to fame is that as, as a full-time operator, the CEO of Documentum, where he joined the company at, with about 25, 30 employees, grew it to over 500 million in revenue, and then sold in 2003 mm -hmm. to uh, EMC for a billion seven, I think you said, right? A billion seven. So a pretty phenomenal success story, starting from really a raw, raw technology startup to uh, what is now one of the biggest um, areas within EMC, which is a very large technology company. So really from, from the beginning through a fantastic exit. Prior to that, uh, Jeff was with um, Adapt Tech with Cadence Design, have Intel, in general management and marketing positions. And so he has over 30 years of experience in the high tech space and has uh, offered to come talk to us today about leadership and his experiences as a technology entrepreneur, executive, CEO, and now venture partner with Redpoint and some of the things he's learned along the way, mistakes he's seen uh, entrepreneurs make and uh, some, of the, some of the good qualities and patterns that he's seen that make successful companies so please join me in welcoming Jeff today. Good evening. Uh, this is going to look funny because I have a mic here and you're not going to hear a mic, but I'm told that allegedly it's uh, helping to uh, record, so I'm not holding this as a prop. Um, so Stacy asked me to uh, come and speak and kind of gave me carte blanche to talk about whatever I wanted. Uh, leadership is something that... Uh, was important to me when I was an operating guy and has become uh, more kind of intellectually interesting and important to me. And in fact, one of my partners and I teach uh, a CEO leadership class. Uh, we've taught it, I don't know, 15, 20 times maybe, to about this many uh, startup CEOs each time uh, connected with a program that Deloitte and Touche has. And so this presentation is a little bit out of that and then a little bit also, hence the other logo, um, out of a training class that I've taught at Documentum for kind of director level people and, uh, and above on, on leadership. Now I tried, to, I tried to think back when I was in your guys' shoes, it's been a while. Uh, Stacy did say it's been over 30 years. That's why, why my hair is gray. Um, and I, w I got right out of school, went, went to work, and then immediately started my MBA. And one of the things I remember is that when I was taking management classes in my MBA school, I had no idea what they were talking about, none. First of all, I had managed anybody. Second of all, I'd barely been managed. So looking back on that, it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't all that useful. Um, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little concerned that today might turn out to be the same for you guys in terms of leadership. But what I hope, I don't know what you're going to get graded on class-wise, if you get one or two ideas out of this that you can use in your daily life, because by the way, leadership doesn't have a lot to do with business. It has, it's, a, it's a human attribute. If you can get a couple of things and carry those into business, I'll at least think this is a really successful, uh, really successful evening. I'm going to kind of hit on three things. I'm going to start off and just show you a little bit of a kind of a profile of what a successful early stage company looks like and then where it can go bad. Lack of leadership is clearly one of them. Um, get into some aspects of leadership and then, and then close with kind of Two things about my leadership experiences. One, laying the foundation for the culture, the leadership culture at Documentum. And number two, I'll walk you through the biggest mistake I ever made in eight years of being a CEO and how we got out of it because it's easy to lead when things are going good. It's not so easy or so fun when they're not going well. So if we look at, a, if we look at an early stage, early stage company, you've got to uh, – Oh, by the way, let me mention one other thing. At the end, and we'll try to leave about 15 minutes or so for questions, if you have questions along the way, um, please, I know there's enough people here that you guys will all be uh, shy, but if you've got a question, raise your hand, um, and I will be happy to call on you. I actually will come up for breath periodically, so you will have time to ask a question. Uh, but I'd be happy to call on you. We can handle the question as we go. So when we look at, at, at early stage companies, the first thing is, do you have a, do you have a real business, okay? VCs typically invest in a market, 
or a technology or a team. I'd love to tell you we invest in all three. We've got all three. It's a no-brainer. Okay, we don't typically have all three. But the first thing is, is there, is there a real business? Is there real value there? Do you have a real business proposition? Do you have a defensible position technologically? Can you make something out of that? Second is, are there operating guys? Even though the team might be very small, is there some experience there? Or is there the willingness, if you've got a couple of technical founders, to hire real operating people so that we've got some reasonable uh, uh, view that there's going to be some operating expertise and that you can move things from this wonderful business plan strategy you've got actually to action and making things happen, move the company along, and ultimately, ultimately grow. And then last but not least, and unfortunately it normally is last but not least, what kind of leadership values, if any, does the team possess? Is there a management team? It's oftentimes just a couple of people, and that's, that's not a problem. But you then have to assimilate a team. You've got to build a team. You've got to create a culture. As you'll see when I talk a little bit more about leadership, if you don't create the culture, the culture will be created. It will fill the vacuums. You kind of have a choice whether you want to create the one you want or you want to kind of let it go and see what develops. Not generally a great formula for success, by the way. Now, what breaks? Uh, if you know anything about the venture capital business, it's a portfolio business. Okay, if we invest in 50 companies in a portfolio, and that's about, that's about right, by the way, we might have five that are, that are really successes. If you're, if you're incredibly lucky, you end up with a, with a Google or an eBay or something like that. That's one in a gazillion, okay? But you could, you could end up with a documentum that does 20 times, returns 20 times your investment. That's a good deal, okay? Um, so you might get 10% that work. You've got another 30% or so that are in some stage of slight success. They might give you some return on your money, or they're kind of even. And most of the rest of them, you just lose your money on, okay? So it's a, it's a portfolio business. We know that more things are going to go wrong than are going to go right. But why do they tend to break? Well, one of them is us and the entrepreneurs, we can just make bad assumptions, okay? It's, a, it's, a, it's an early stage deal. You've got early stage technology, market, people. So you've got to make a ton of assumptions, and you've got to go forward with them. They're not all going to be right. In fact, maybe, not, maybe most of them won't be right. It's only a question of how deadly they may turn out to be. But you may end up with the market might not be as big as you think. Your value proposition or the problem you're solving, um, one of the probably the deadliest instance we see is where a company develops something that is really nice to have and nobody has to have it. In today's environment, particularly in the IT world, and that's where most of our, uh, our work is, People don't buy stuff that, they, that are nice to have. They buy things they have to have. They have to have to solve problems. So it may be that you develop something that was really a good idea. It just turns out it's not good enough. Okay? Access to the market. Competition. You always have some set of assumptions about what your competitors are going to do. You've got some known competitors, typically some big guys. You're hoping they're going to they're act slow while you act fast. Um, and then there's, you know, unbeknownst to you, there's another three guys and a dog in a garage. <laughs> And they're developing the same kind of widget. Maybe they do it better and quicker. You don't know, and, and we don't know. We're willing to take those risks. And last but not least, it may turn out that you require more capital to move along than we think. So those things happen, and it's easy for the VCs to say, you know, that's life. It's a little more difficult for you, the entrepreneur. We have a portfolio of 50 companies. You have a portfolio of one at any given time. So it's a little tougher. But the other thing that happens is all these things actually work. And the company still fails. And the company fails because the leadership is weak. People don't hire people that are good enough. The CEO doesn't hire, doesn't try to hire people that are better than he or she are in every, in every, possible, in every possible way. They don't change things, change in their business. They don't change quick enough. And somehow the team doesn't quite come together. And when that happens, basically everything goes south and it's only a matter of time. Sometimes you can swap out the CEO and that's always the first thing the board does, by the way. Um, but it's, it's tough. So we face a lot of those. Those are the ones that are the biggest disappointments. When we have our assumptions right and we still fail. So 
what, is, what does this leadership stuff look like? What's the essence of leadership? Um, I actually consulted Webster's on the way here today. Um, not terribly enlightening, by the way. Uh, under leadership, it says capacity to lead. Okay, that was interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you know, I looked up leader, and other than, other than one five-sentence description of somebody in a totalitarian government that I didn't think was terribly applicable, um, you know, not terribly enlightening. Capacity to lead, great. That's kind of looking at the leader from the front. Let's walk around the back of the leader, because I actually think that's the important thing. A leader is very simply someone who people follow. Napoleon used to say, I have to know where my people are going so I can lead them there. You're going to run to the front of the parade and, and, and lead them. That's OK. OK, a leader is somebody that somebody follows. So we're going to talk a little bit about what's the work of leaders, what's a leader look like, what are their characteristics, what are some assumptions of leaders, what are the golden rules of leadership, and then some examples of uh, where, it's, where it's worked for me and maybe where it hasn't. So what's the work of leaders? Well, the first thing is, to be a leader, you've got to be willing to assume the leadership role. And that means every morning when you get up, you have to think about, OK, what am I actually going to do? What am I going to lead today? What, what actions do I have to take that are going to be of a leadership nature? Because it doesn't ha it's really easy to just go in your office and not lead. Okay, because leading means you've got to step out in front. Now, if you don't lead, something or somebody else will. Nature abhors a vacuum. Okay, you guys are engineering students. I'm sure you learned that somewhere. Might have been physics. Uh, you know, there will be something that fills that vacuum. And if it isn't you, you're going to get a different leadership style or a different leadership direction. Probably not going to get what you, what you want. <coughs> One of the most important things is what I call set the table. You get to decide what is important. Depending on your personal capabilities, you may create the vision. More often than that, you're probably going to bless the vision. Um, I was very clear in my company. There were two technical founders at Documentum um, who were great technical guys and to their credit knew that they did not want to be, nor were they particularly well adapted to be the CEO. Okay? but they were in charge of the vision. I blessed that vision. I, I, they created the vision. We tuned it along with the executive staff. Ultimately, I ended up saying as the, as the CEO, OK, here's what we're doing. And that led to translating the mission and the vision into actions, into plans, into key strategies. What, are the key, what does it mean that we're going to do product-wise now? What impact does that have on our sales strategy? What kind of sales strategy are we going to have? What kind of marketing strategy? As you'll see, some of you, I think, were in the previous class, Stacy's previous class. Uh, at Documentum, we decided to do something pretty unique and take a, a very pointed vertical marketing approach. Very important strategy for the, uh, for the CEO to, uh, to come up with or, or to bless. In my case, this was one that I personally, uh, uh, personally drove. But you've got to translate things into actions and to goals so people know what they have to do. You also have to allocate resources of all types of currencies. Jack Welch, a pretty well-known and pretty well-accepted CEO, once said he only had two jobs, developing people and allocating resources. That's it. Probably a gross oversimplification for the CEO of GE or, and probably this too, a really astute observation. So as a leader, whether you're the CEO or you're the leader of your, uh, you know, one of your study groups here, you've got to allocate resources. You've got to allocate people. You might do that in a study group. As in a company, you've got to allocate funds. My guess is that's a pretty easy job in a study group. There's probably not a lot of funds to go around, but somebody's got to buy coffee. Um, you also have to allocate the most important resource that any organization has. And the great thing is everybody has the exact same amount of this. It's time. And so you get to say what is important and, therefore, what people will spend time on, how they will allocate. You don't actually get to allocate all 24 hours of their day, although in a startup it will seem that way. Um, in fact, it will seem like it's about 30. Uh, but you get to allocate at least their work lives. Um, not in a dictatorial manner, but you're responsible for that allocation. You also have to prepare people for change. You don't 
run a business or a group or maybe even a study group if it goes long enough um, without something coming in and changing. Okay, the competition changed, the product changed, the opportunity changed, the customers changed. Who knows? Something changed. Y2K came along. You know, I mean, who would have ever thought it would actually ever get to the year 2000? You would have thought that this was a change we could have seen coming for like 2,000 years. Guess what? Everybody was surprised when it happened. It had a huge impact on the IT business. I'll talk to you about the impact it had on our business. So you've got to prepare people for that. It's your job to calm them about that, not to hide it. Change is change. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's bad. You've got to prepare them for that and educate them on it and get them ready to react to it and move ahead. You've got to communicate. The CEO of a company is, among other things, the chief communications officer. You, you come up with a strategy, you come up with a plan, whatever, and you communicate it. And you do it again, and you do it again, and you do it again, and you do it again. And about the time when, you know, you can do it in your sleep, you're partway there. And you keep, you keep doing it until your people say, Jeff, Please don't do that again. We got it. And let me, let me give it back to you. Boom, 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 boom. And they've got it. Okay? Because you, you have to communicate more than, you, more than you think. You've got to obviously, maybe it's obvious, maybe it's not, um, one way or the other, you will, as the leader, you will model the cultural values of the organization. You might be doing it very consciously, which is hopefully a good thing, um, or you might be doing it very unconsciously, which in my experience is normally a bad thing because not many people are good enough unconsciously to uh, kind of show the right values. But what you do, not what you say, not what you do will tell people what's appropriate in your company. When Stacy comes to me with a problem as the leader and after hearing the first sentence of the problem, my reaction is to try to remove her head she might not come to me as easily the next time around because she likes having her head and her shoulders, probably likes having her job, okay? If, on the other hand, I might be upset. You can't be, you know, you can't fake this, uh, and I'll walk you through an example of this. You might be really upset about it, but isn't it probably better to let her tell me, tell me the problem. Let's figure it out. How can we work on it? How can we make it better? How can we solve it? Those are two very, very different values. And by the way, if the top person does that, it's okay for everybody else to do it. If the top person abuses somebody who brings them a problem, everybody will do that. And last but not least, as the leader, you may think you're in charge. Um, it's actually the other way around. Uh, we had about 1,200 people when I retired as CEO at Documentum. We had 1,200 people in the company. The way I looked at it, I worked for 1,200 people, about 2,500 customers, an untold number of investors, and so I wondered why my days were long. I had a lot of bosses because they actually didn't work for me. I worked for them. Um, my schedule was, although I was, you know, I was the leader, I was the CEO, one would think my schedule was mine. No, my schedule was theirs. I got to choose which things I did and, and where I allocated my time, scarce resource, right? But the reality was I was doing it to serve them, and that's what a leader has to do. So characteristics, we won't spend a lot of time on this. They're pretty, they're pretty straightforward. You've got to be the kind of person you'd want to have as a leader. You want somebody who's honest. You want somebody who's good at their job. Now, it is, it is interesting. In a startup company, what often happens in good startup companies, well-funded, well-staffed startup companies, everybody at kind of the executive staff level has done their job before, sales VP, Done it before. Marketing VP, done it before. VP of engineering, churned out lots of products, been the VP of engineering a couple times around. Everybody's done their job before except the CEO because he's a first-time or she is a first-time CEO, which is the norm, by the way. So here you've gone out. You've hired these great people. They know and you know that they're really good at their jobs. And they kind of wonder how good you are at yours because it's the first time you're doing it. That's, that's the norm, not the, not the exception. So you've got to show them you're competent. You can't tell them you're competent. You've got to show them you're competent. Inspiring, broad-minded, intelligent, that helps. Um, hopefully your people are really intelligent, so you better be reasonably intelligent to keep up with them. You don't have to be, I mean, 
I could never keep up with Howard, my technical founder, on, not, on the, not on the product, okay? If I could have, it would have been a problem. But we got talking about sales or marketing or, or how to translate what the product did to something a customer might actually want. He thought I was a pretty smart guy, okay? So you got to be intelligent in, in the ways that, that can leverage um, your organization. So what do leaders look like? You've got a mission that matters, matters to you. You've got to be committed. And you've got to show that commitment every single day. There's lots of ways to do that. Um, early on and for, for a while at Documentum, one of my ways of showing commitment is to the best of my ability, I was the first guy there in the morning and the last person to leave. That's okay for a while. <laughs> it actually, if you want to, I was, I was and am still to the same woman married at the time. Be careful how I state that. Um, so, but this, this uh, first one in, last guy out, uh, only went for so long, as you might imagine. But it's, you know, you want to be committed. You want to show them, I'm there. If we got to work on Saturday, I'm there. Right? we got to work long, I'm there. This is a problem, I'm there. So you got to show them you're committed. We're going to dig into a problem, I'm there. By the way, if it's your job, you're there, and I'm not there to do your job, but if you need me, I'm there. So you want to show that you're committed. You've got to have, you've got to have, I think, you've got to have great ethics. Great ethics are really simple. You'll see later on, doing the right thing is always the right thing to do, and it's, and it's simple, okay? Sometimes you get confused as to, as to, you know, whether you ought to do it or not. Normally, it's because the right thing to do is painful, but you know it's the right thing to do, so you, so you do it. Risk taker, decision maker, a team builder. Um, that's what you're doing. You're building a team, okay? The whole objective here is to build a team that's going to service your customers or bring you to your end. If, again, if you're the leader in a study group, okay, you've got a team, and the team has got to produce some output that's hopefully going to get you all great grades. That's, that's, that's the output there. So you want, to, you want to build your team. You want to work with the team. You don't want to try to alienate the team. One of the, one of the best things about leaders, or maybe one of the most telling things, is what their assumptions are about the people they lead. How do they think about the people? It turns out, if you think like this, if you think what I'll call positively, that people want to be led, that people fundamentally are committed, they're hardworking, they're honest, they're like you, they're like me, right? If you think that way and you treat them that way, they will see that, and by and large, they'll be that way. They're not all. They're, you know, you're going to make some, there, there's going to be some mistakes. You're going to make some hiring mistakes. There's going to be some people that just don't fit. Um, they, may not, they may not fit culturally. Uh, I spent uh, seven years, Stacy mentioned, I spent seven years at Intel. Intel's a phenomenal company. I always say I got my MBA from Santa Clara and my doctorate from Intel. But Intel has a very unique culture. It's based on something they call constructive confrontation. The part you can be absolutely sure of is the confrontation part. Most of the time you can be sure of the, construct, of the constructive part. But it's kind of in your face. And people, people get after your ideas and your thoughts hard. Not against you. They do it right. But they, they, they probe. They push hard. Um, I had a woman that worked for me in, one time in marketing. And about the second time I did that, she burst into tears and said, why do you hate me? I've thought about this. I actually don't think I was doing a bad, uh, the way I was doing it, I was not doing a bad leadership job. She was not suited to the culture of that company. She was not suited to the level of frankness and candidness that were the norm in that company. Some people are, some people are. Didn't mean she was bad. She's actually a very talented, very talented person. So you want to think about people. You want to think about, you know, how do you think about them? Do, th do you think they want to succeed? Or do you feel like, well, no, people want to slough off and I have to make them succeed? I argue if you give them the benefit of the doubt, you take the higher plane, that's what you will get in return as a leader. Everybody gets motivated by something, okay? Some of us are type A behaviors. We get, we get motivated by achievement. I just want to do the next thing. I want to develop the next product. I want to get the next sale. That's the way I feel good in the morning. Some people get motivated by power. I get a little concerned about that. Okay, 
Um, I would much rather that you worked on personal power than position power within an organization. If you work on personal power, a great, great position within an organization is, is product marketing manager. You are responsible for everything, 100% of a particular product. You have authority for nothing. It's just you. And oh, by the way, there's a bunch of engineers that are working on the product, but they don't report to you. There's a bunch of sales guys that sell the product, and they don't report to you. There's a bunch of finance guys, and they don't report to you. And if the product screws up, it's your fault. Hmm, okay. That doesn't seem very fair. Might not be. That's the way organizations are. That actually is a very typical uh, role for a product marketing person. If you can be successful in that role by influencing people, and I mean that's a positive word, by the way, not a negative word, okay, by influencing people and showing them why it makes sense for them to add that extra feature, keep the price up a little higher, whatever it is, okay, all of a sudden you get really good. And if you, as you go along in your career, you get a little position power to go with that, you can be very, very good. Affiliation autonomy. Some people have a real need for safety and security. Those people that do typically probably shouldn't be in a startup. It's not a very safe environment. Um, but probably the way you as a leader can make it the safest is by explaining the, the, uh, um, the fears to them, explaining what the risks really are, trying to quantify them, because there's nothing scarier than the great unknown. But if I tell you, here's the deal, here's what we got to go through, here's what we have to do in terms of developing the product, all that kind of thing, gee, there's a lot of risks here, but, you know, we knew that coming in, then as they measure progress, they can get more and more and more comfortable. Just a second. Leaders understand where leverage lot lives, lies. Basically, you've got four points here that a leader has to do. You have to see what you want to do. You've got to have the vision or bless it. You've got to structure it. You've got to put it in some context. Okay, why are we doing this? Here's the vision, but there's a set of actions. Why are we doing this? How does this fit in the context of our vision? Let me explain that to you. And then you go into, into action mode, okay? We now got the set of actions. We're going to do it. We're going to measure our success against it, and we're going to loop back. And periodically, we're going to loop back up to the planning loop. Now, this is probably as good a place as any to mention. One of the most important things about being a leader is to know yourself. Know what you personally are good at or what you personally gravitate towards. I'm an action guy, okay? I'm an operating guy. I get stuff done. I am not necessarily a planning guy. I know that about myself. So what I did to make sure that we did the planning loop is I fooled myself twice a year, eight years, never learned. It's a good thing. I fooled myself. How did I fool myself? Twice a year, I gave myself a task. Remember, I'm the operating guy. I'm really good at executing tasks. I gave myself a task, which was do a strategic plan and then update it on the sixth month. That became a task. Okay, this task came up on my list, time to do it now. We implement it. We did a great job of it. If I hadn't made that a task and put that into my comfort level, we wouldn't have done a good, as good a job as planning. It would have been more haphazard because I knew myself. I knew that just that wasn't the thing I woke up and, and thought about every day. A couple of my other guys did, okay? But between that, I, I put something that was kind of not in my comfort zone found a comfort zone for it, and we did it and executed on it very well. So some golden rules. Lead, lead as you'd like to be led. I mentioned that. What you do dwarfs what you say. You can get up and, and be as eloquent as you want, but when you turn around and do something that doesn't have the highest, highest ethics or you say it's, you know, we've got really open, honest communication, and, and I, you know, rip Aaron when he, when he brings a problem to me, that's what people remember, not what I said. Don't shy away from, I don't know, and I'm sorry. As the leader, you do not have to be all-knowing or omnipotent or anything else, because you're not, by the way. And it may surprise you, but the people that work for you actually know that. Uh, in fact, they know it real well. They figure out pretty well what you're good at and what you're not. So if you do something wrong, hey, sorry, screwed that one up. Somebody asked you a question, you know, I don't know the answer to that. So let me in the next couple of minutes, and then we'll uh, open up for questions, shift to uh, some real-life experiences. And I'm going to hit on two of them. One is 
a cultural foundation that I laid at Documentum. Uh, and as I mentioned to some people in the previous class, uh, I had worked for 20 years, graduated from Santa Clara in 73, uh, the middle of 93, left Cadence Design Systems, uh, and went looking for a company to run. I'd kind of done everything else, come up the ladder, been the general management of a couple of big divisions of a couple of companies, done everything but want, run a company, and that's what I wanted to do. Um, over the course of three months, I looked at 30 different companies, ultimately selecting Documentum. But as part of that, I took a step back and I said, you know, Jeff, you've worked for 20 years. Surely you've learned something in 20 years. And as the CEO, are there a, what, are there a couple of things that you want to imprint into the DNA of whatever company it is that you're going to run? And I came up with four. First was uh, something that I call open, honest communication. And this was a, this was a mixture of the constructive confrontation from Intel and then the first startup I did was a company called Adapt Tech, and the CEO there was from IBM. And so he demonstrated IBM's concern for the individual. And we kind of married those two um, cultures into something we came to call open, honest communication, and I carried to, uh, I carried to Documentum. So all of, the, all of the candor of the Intel culture, but the respect for the individual of the IBM culture, which really means... If I'm really going to chew you out, I'm going to do it in private, not in public, okay, number one. It doesn't mean that I'm not going to ask you every tough question I can think of if we're trying to get to the bottom of, of an issue or an opportunity, and that I'm not going to expect you to do the same to me, even though I'm the CEO. You can ask me any question you want. There was only two questions I never answered. How was the quarter, and what, what are we doing? Is there anything going on in terms of M&A? So you just don't answer those questions because you don't want to end up rooming with Bubba in the big house, but that's a different issue. So open, honest communication was a very important aspect uh, for us. Probably the most uh, famous example of that was about a year, year and a half into my tenure as, as CEO. We had a release coming out. Um, we were, uh, this release had every feature any customer would ever want. Unfortunately, it didn't work. That didn't keep us from releasing it, however. So we released the software at the end of, uh, I think it was 94. Um, days later, we started getting feedback from customers that was very bad. So, you know, it's okay. We know how to execute. We quickly took a look at things and said, okay, we're going to do, we're going to fix stuff here, guys. So we're going to do a maintenance release. We're going to do it in three months. We're going to get it all done. Product's going to be great. Started working on that through the first quarter of the year. Executive staff meetings. How's the product coming? Great, great. Development's coming great. I'm walking the halls, and all I hear is, oh, my God, this thing's horrible. Every time we fix something, we break two other things, you know, you know, bad. So I called a meeting, which became a, a rather legendary meeting. The executive staff and kind of the, the key people in development, key developers and some product marketing people, and said, um, this is either going to be a really long or a really short meeting. When I talk to the executive staff, I hear everything is great on 2.1 or whatever it was. When I just walk through the company, I hear we've got big problems. I just need to know which one's real. And then I did something that for me, and maybe you'll notice this since I haven't taken a breath yet, um, I don't shut up well. However, once again, knowing yourself, it turns out if you bite the inside of your cheek really hard, it's very difficult to talk. And so I did that, and I was what I was absolutely guaranteed of, what I guaranteed myself is that the next sound that was made in that room would not come from me, other than perhaps a whimper if I bit my cheek too hard. Um, so I did not say anything, and there was a very, very, very long pregnant pause, and finally one of our developers cleared his throat and said, Jeff, we're in deep trouble. You know, this doesn't work. You know, everything we fix, we break something else. And then it all kind of just, you know, this cathartic release came out. And we were, in fact, in huge trouble. Nobody died in that meeting. There was no bloodletting, either, either literally or figuratively. Um, but the reason was, because I was pretty sure that was the answer anyway, and I had conditioned myself. I, I'm, a, I'm an Irish background. I'm perfectly capable of flaming on instantly, okay? 
So it took a little, I had to like, you know, look in the mirror and say, you will not flame on in this meeting. This is not going to help. Um, and so that meeting became legendary. This was the worst possible news they could have told us. And it, by the way, it was actually a lot worse than I even thought. Um, it, it, did, it took us six months to get it right. We did get it right. And the company flourished after that. But that meeting became famous for open, honest communication. If they could tell the CEO how bad that was and walk out with their jobs and an action plan to go make it better, maybe this was a pretty good place to work. MBOs, management by objectives. Probably all heard about this. Um, you always have too much to do. Uh, you've got to focus on the few most important things. Um, and so this was one of the fundamental tenets of, uh, of our, of our uh, company. Every quarter, everybody took their top five things and focused on that. I had one guy that had a very, very difficult time doing this. He always had a laundry list of 20 things to do. They were all good. And I finally said, you know, after asking him to pick five and whatnot, I finally said, Chip, here's the deal. I'm going to pick five. I'm going to pay you on those five. You do whatever you want. Okay, but be very clear. Here's what you're getting paid on. So that was not the most elegant way to do it, but I tried everything else. That was about half successful, by the way, with him, so it doesn't always work. Quality meeting mutually agreed upon requirements. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail on this, but there is a, a guy by the name of Phil Crosby who wrote Quality is Free, which is an incredibly powerful book, not the most um, exciting read, but just an incredibly powerful book. And when you define quality as meeting mutually agreed upon requirements, it turns out that you always know whether you're doing a quality job or not. And it frees you. It's very easy to say, this is high quality, that is not, and therefore you know what to do. Very freeing experience. And last but not least, crossing the chasm. Um, I could spend another several hours talking about this. I won't. Uh, but this is a vertical marketing strategy where you're trying, to, you're trying to ultimately win the entire market, but you take it market by market by market. And the key is you start off by focusing on a single vertical market providing a single solution. That's what you're going to, that's what you're going to, the customers you're going to do anything for. Anybody else you'll sell standard product to. But you're going to use that as a stepping stone to actually grow bigger, faster. It sounds counterintuitive that you can get bigger, quicker by focusing down, but it turns out it works. So this is the work of a gentleman by the name of Jeffrey Moore, who I think has spoken here, has become a, a pretty famous business, business author. Crossing the Chasm actually is a delightful read. Um, that is the name of the book. Um, so, and it is a wonderful read, as well as being incredibly uh, enlightening. So let me tell you about some bad times, and then I want to get, take some, some questions. Um, we came out in 1998 on a tear, $125 million a year. Our company grew 2, 10, 25, 45, 75, 125. Never going to stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it did. Um, we ran into a perfect storm in 1999. Uh, some of our own doing, some of not. First of all, the, the, this was in the beginning part of the Internet bubble. So anything that was connected to the Internet was hot. Anything that wasn't was cold. We were not connected. We were not really Internet uh, savvy at that point. The biggest mistake I made as a CEO in eight years is I took a year too long to get us onto the Internet. By the way, probably the, in the top three things I did right was once I figured that out, we got on there really quickly. But we ran into a perfect storm in the beginning of 1999. The internet bubble, which we had no answer for. Y2K, I, I joked earlier that, you know, how could we have not seen this coming? We saw it coming. We just didn't know what the effect was going to be. Turned out nobody wanted to buy anything. They were all taking, all the IT managers were taking all of their resources, all their people, and making sure that the stuff worked when the clock struck 12 at the beginning of 2000. They didn't want to buy anything. So our sales dried up. And then, in addition to that, we did something that was very logical, which is we went from essentially providing a platform and a solution, kind of, kind of marketing a solution but selling a platform, we decided we would develop our own applications on top of this platform. Pretty logical thing to do. Turns out it's a disaster. The only, company, the only software companies that can do that are literally the size of Oracle, in my opinion. You cannot do that as a small company. So at a time when we were late to market with the thing that was selling, internet-oriented stuff, and we had a slowdown in sales, we put an extra requirement on the organization. So this was not the best of times. But the good news was we figured that out pretty quickly. 
made some tough decisions, communicated them, and implemented them. Uh, for the only time in my eight years as CEO, I went outside to get validation on what was really wrong. I was pretty sure I knew what was wrong with the company, but I didn't want to. I didn't want to count, frankly, just on on my view of it, particularly because I was not at that time particularly savvy on the internet, and I wasn't sure I had this internet thing right. So I actually hired McKinsey, and they came in and, and did a, a very quick, wonderful piece of work for us and, and basically validated that what we were seeing as our problems was, in fact, it. And then we went in. We changed, made some key organizational changes. I took our, our founder, who was the VP of engineering, made him CTO. I needed him to focus more than executed. I got rid of the VP of sales. I got rid of the VP of services. We went back to being more solutions-focused. I cut out the entire applications part of, our, part of our business. And in six months, we went from not having an internet solution at all to having the best one on the market. And from that, we got back. You can see this one wonderful trend that went. <clears throat> but we got back on the right trend, got growing again. Actually, between 98 and 99, we did grow ever so slightly. Uh, 99 was a pretty tough year for everybody with Y2K. So that was actually reasonable performance. And then we took off in 2000, and as Stacy said, you know, we've now grown from uh, 98 was 125 million, 2005 was something over 500 million as part of the MC. So it worked, but it was uh, it was not the best of times. So I know that this has been probably a little bit like trying to take a sip out of a fire hose. But having said that, I'm going to uh, we've got about 10 minutes uh, still for questions, and I wanted to leave some open. So yeah. So as an ex alum of Intel as well, yeah. always out of touch. And they almost always have sycophants at the level immediately to this point. And it sounds like you tried to work past that. But what are some other tips you can do to keep yourself on the net? Because the company, how it's behaving, is known by the people <coughs> that are on the bottom. Not so much usually the people at the top, because nobody wants to tell their boss bad news. So the, so the question the question was, how does the CEO keep in touch with the with the company? So first of all, it is a lot easier to do it with a small company. Okay, I mean, if you can get everybody in the room that's, that's this big or, or earlier on, you know, around this table, keeping in touch isn't very hard. However, that doesn't scale. And this is all about leadership is all about scaling. First of all, I think the fundamental culture, and I would argue that Intel actually does a pretty good job, because their culture is so much candid conversation, bad news does travel up in that organization. It doesn't in a, in a lot of them. One of the things you have to do is if, if early on, if you can really get a culture of open, honest communication, you've got a much better chance of having that bad news surface sooner. The other thing is HP's got a term for it, management by walking around. Walk around and talk to people. Pop into people's office. How you doing? What's going on? What are you working on? And one of the things I used to tell people is, by the way, I'm going to walk around. I'm going to pop into your office. If I don't see your MBOs on your cube, I'm going to ask why. Because, gee, doesn't that tell you what you're supposed to be working on every day? You know, it's like a pretty easy quiz to, to start off with. So I would do that. Just, just, just talk to people. Um, we would do 360 reviews on every manager in the company, including the CEO. 360 reviews is exactly what it sounds like, right? If you're a director, your direct, your direct reports give feedback. Your peers give feedback. Your bosses give feedback. Okay, I got feedback from, from I didn't have any peers. If you're the CEO, but I got, I got bosses called the board. I've got subordinates called vice presidents. I got feedback. It was pretty candid. Changed some of my behavior. So I think those are the things you try to do to keep in touch. Great question. Yeah, in the back. Um, regarding your, your policy on open, honest communication, uh, what do you call, how do you comment on Sony's, uh, Sony's versus Intel's policy on two teams working against each other, the, you know, that cooperative com uh, well, I'm not, I'm not sure specifically. Uh, so the question is, how do I comment on Sony and, and Intel's teams? Are they, are they competing with one another on? Same project, okay. with one another, but Sony has failed horribly. Okay, so, it, so the, the question was kind of, it, in the interest of open, honest communication, what if you have competing teams? Actually, a lot of companies, um, IBM used to do that for years. They would have competing teams trying to work on taking different approaches. And trying to get to the next, you know, the next great disk drive or whatever, whatever it would be. Um, I don't see anything that, that conflicts with open, honest communication there at all. The objective, you're all on the same team, okay? One of the things I used to do, and if I ever thought that um, 
for lack of a not very scientific term, if I, if I saw bickering going on within our organization, the thing I would try to remember, we'd all get in a room and I'd say, guys, the enemy is outside this room. We're all on the same team. So if we're kind of, you know, families bicker, that's okay. You can have a little bit of that. But you've got to remember you're all going the same direction. You're all pulling on the same team. So, so why are we bickering? Probably there's a, normally when you get to that, it turns out somebody has an assumption that's different than somebody else's. So I don't see any conflict with having competition between, between teams. And by the way, you're going to ultimately feed, you're going to feed the eagle and starve the turkey, by the way. At some point, you got to you got to do that, um, and the same thing with with resources. In some way, all resources compete. You only got so much, you only have so many people, so much money, and so much time. So when you're doing a budget, if I give more to sales than I do to engineering, they're competing with each other, in a way. But you explain the strategy. You say, you know, the product's in good shape now, but our distribution channel isn't robust enough. Therefore, the logical thing to do is to overinvest in sales, and hold engineering this year more where it is. Next year we might change that. So I think I think through I think open honest communication actually helps in that uh, competition or coopetition kind of kind of approach. Yes. How do you make sure the right objectives get defined for your management by objectives? That's a great so the question is how do you make sure that the right objectives get defined? That's a really good question. Um, there's there's several processes you can go through. Um, what I try to do, and there's a lot of different ways to do this, is I try to do both the top down and the bottom up, okay? So for example, what I would typically do at the beginning of a quarter is I would write down five or six key objectives that I thought were the most important ones and, and put underneath them what we called key results, kind of actions that if they happened would be measurable. And I would give it to my executive staff. And their, their options were basically to either Look at it and agree, yep, this is good. Look at it and say, I think the objectives are right, but I, I change things. Or disagree and say, you know, these six things are kind of interesting, Jeff, but there's two more that you missed, and they've got to be on here, and two of them got to come off. And so we would have a formal process. Where I would send it out, they would take a look at it, and we'd get together, and, and we'd, we'd mull through, you know, and come to a, an agreement of, okay, what are the top objectives, and what are the key actions under those that if we do those, we think we will have met the objectives. Um, and then I would ask them to do the same thing with, with their group and so on and, and, and so on. So we would get things that came up from the bottom and, and ideas, at least, that came down from the, from the top. And a lot of times, you know, nobody ever took my six objectives and said, gee, you went 0 for 6, Jeff. Uh, if you did that too much as the CEO, you got a different issue. But there would be often times where they would get changed, modified, replaced, you know, various ones, and that was great. Uh, and, and I'd look at it and go, yep, you're right. This other one's, you know, I don't know how I forgot that one. It's more important. And so that, that's how we would do it. And then we would communicate it to everybody. It would get published. I'd present it at a company meeting. Everybody knew what we were doing. In fact, we had a, we had a saying at, at, uh, at Documentum, we may not be right, but we're not confused. Everybody in the company knew where we were going. And by the way, my, my experience is if you can put together a plan that is – like 80% right, and you get 100% of your resources executing it, you win. Virtually nobody does that. Everybody tries to get the plan 100% right and doesn't worry about how the resources are applied against it. So I would argue if you get vaguely right and get 100% unification going against it, you'll win. Probably got time for a couple more. Yes? I was just curious. What does Documentum do? Documentum is a software company. Uh, we used to say that we did document management. We now call it content management. But a way to think of it is if you think about that structured information goes into a relational database, okay, so you might have um, money, demographics, whatever, unstructured every information, text, graphics, images, CAD files, everything else should go into some other kind of database, and we call it a doc base. And so we basically manage all the unstructured information in an organization. So in a pharmaceutical company, it might be managing the, the new drug applications that go to market. In an engineering construction company like Bechtel, for example, we manage all their project plans. We manage their CAD files for their, for their projects. In a manufacturing plant, it might be the standard operating procedures. Um, can be any one of a, you know, in a, in a law firm, 
it's everything because it's all unstructured information. That's what we do. We make it more available. We make it more um, uh, introduce it or, or integrate it into, into business flows, what we call workflows, uh, and make companies more, uh, more effective by helping them manage that information in an integrated way into their businesses. Yes? So the question is, would I describe a leader as 100% logical? I think I'm a good leader, and, and I know I'm not 100% logical, so the answer is no. Um, no, I don't think you have to be 100% logical. First of all, I'm not even sure what 100% logical really would be. Um, but, you know, for me, um, sometimes the right thing to do has more to do with feelings than logic. Um, I've never been accused of being Dr. Spock. Um, so sometimes, sometimes, you know, what you feel is the right thing to do. Or you're working with you're working with somebody, and you know, they've got an issue, and and it's 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 not a logical answer. It's how do you how do you get them? How do you make them more self confident? That's not a logical thing, right? How do I build them up a little bit? That's not a, that's more of a feeling thing. So logic certainly helps, but logic intelligence to me is you know it's not the same thing, but it's on the same side of the equation. But I think you've got to have a feeling for people. What you know, the people, who are you leading? You're leading people. You're not leading robots. You're leading people. By the way, robots would be a hell of a lot easier and a lot less interesting. Um, but, you know, you're, you're leading other people. And, and to the extent that you're not 100% logical and you don't probably act 100% logical in every part of your life, neither do the rest of us. So you probably don't want to be led in a 100% logical manner. You know, having logic and, and being that is, a, is an important thing. It's not 100%. One more, and then we'll, uh, yes, way in the back. This is more of a personal question. Um, I, uh, commend, uh, I commend you on your relationship with your wife. Where do you draw the line between business and personal life? Boy. <laughs> you know, it always turns out you let them ask one question too many. Um, well, first of all, it's really important to understand in what organization you are the CEO and in what organization you're not, okay? And it's not that I'm not the CEO, but my marriage at least, I hope everybody's is, it's not a hierarchical deal, it's a partnership, okay? So, you know, we had an agreement. Um, kind of what, you know, there, we got to an agreed upon, and it took me two startups to get it right, by the way. Uh, my first startup, uh, which was Adaptech, uh, I was going out with my now wife. This was in 1983. Um, and I said, you know, we were both working at Intel. Intel, you work a lot of hours at Intel. And I said, I want to go do this startup. But, uh, you know, I think I'm really going to work a lot of hours. And if that's not okay with you, you know, I, 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 don't, I won't do it. She said, I don't think you can work more hours than you work at Intel. So, well, I don't know. I said, but I tell you what. I will, for, for, the, next, for the first two years of this, I will guarantee you Sundays. You get Sundays. And if there's more to give, you get that too, but I'll guarantee you Sundays. She got Sundays for two years. Um, she was very good about that, except a couple of times when I came home and said sometime during the middle of the week, hey, guess, guess what I'm doing this weekend? Weekend meant Sunday because I was working on Saturday. Um, I'm going sailing. So and so, you know, Larry asked me to, you know, go sailing on his boat, and I'd go through this whole thing, and she'd go, no, you're not. <laughs> and I'm a little bit, no, 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 I am. No, really, yeah, we got, you know, got the boat. No, you're not. It was about the third or five. I mean, I am a slow study sometimes. I'm not. No, because Sundays are mine. I get seasick, and I'm not going sailing, and neither are you. <laughs> and that was the bargain. So I called up Larry and said, Larry, I'm not going sailing. You know, not on Sunday at least. Uh, and, and so, you know, we, we got... My agreement with, with uh, my wife was that the norm, my norm at, at Documentum was work-wise. I left the house at, typically at 5.30 in the morning, but I went to work out. Like, nobody cared what I did at 6 a.m. Um, <laughs> roughly 8 in the morning till 7 at night was what I thought I agreed to. What she said she agreed to was 8 to 8 because that's what I actually gave her. I didn't get home until 8 o'clock, not 7 o'clock. Um, but as long as that was kind of the norm, we were okay. And there was, there was, it was okay to have emergencies, but you can't have an emergency all the time. 
Um, it's like one of my key developers told me one time, Jeff, it's really nice that you feed us dinner here. If you feed us dinner every night, it's not that much of a perk. <laughs> it's kind of the same thing with my wife. So that was the deal. You got you to figure out what the boundaries are for you and for, and for her, your significant other, and work it out and come to some agreement and hope you don't screw it up too many times. You will occasionally. And when you do, drop back to the slide that says, don't be afraid to say you're sorry. And with that, that seems like a really good point to end on. So thank you all very much. <laughs>